Well, thank you, um, and uh, dear Ambassador, Your Excellency, I'll say. Thank you very much for your really very kind words. It's very much appreciated. Um, I don't get these kind words that often, so uh, <laughs> that's, that's very special. I'm glad I came all the way here to the U.S. to, uh, to receive these kind words, especially in front of my colleagues, so they can hopefully relay it. Yeah. So it is with great pleasure that I accepted this invitation, um, not only because you asked for it, uh, but it was an important part, I will say that. The fact that you asked me to accept this invi uh, invitation this award was a very good reason for me to do so. And of course, we are here in a very special place, um, the center of the power of the world. And also in a beautiful building, which I had never actually known of its existence. Most of the times we come here, we go to offices, and they don't look as nice as here, that's, uh, <laughs> that's for sure. I'm also honored that I've been given an opportunity to address you um, and represent as such Aegon, Aegon Transamerica. We were not that close to selling the tower, but there was a little bit of a starting <laughs> as we received the Heineken Award. It has been said earlier also, um, has been said by you, uh, Josephine, that uh, Freddie Heineken is an example of success for many. Um, I think everybody in Holland, and I hope in many places around the world will know Freddy Heineken and will recognize him and will feel always a sense of warmth. And I think that is very important. He had this personal aspect to his life too. And, uh, and I think this is also one of the reasons that his, um, his entrepreneurship was unparalleled uh, because he understood very well and valued the importance of relationships uh, wherever, but also here between the United States and, and, and the Netherlands. Um, you mentioned it, it's a leader who, through perseverance, innovative power and a lot of humor, uh, that was not always understood by everybody, but a lot of humor, contributed to the success of his family's business, both here in, in the Netherlands, but also in the rest of the world. And I also always think that this entrepreneurial spirit is something that binds us with you, with the United States, between the Netherlands and the US, um, and I might say a few words because it's something I experienced myself also when with the family we lived for a year in, uh, in Baltimore. That was in the 2000s and it was a wonderful time. Um, we lived together. The only uh, sad thing of it was that it ended after one year and that I had to go back and uh, take over the role uh, of CEO of Egon, not knowing of course that this was three months before the crisis. Um, that was an tough experience after a wonderful time here in the US, moving back to Holland and being confronted with a financial crisis, which nobody at that time had any idea how it was going to end, but fortunately it ended. So our company, the parent company of Transamerica, was founded 175 years ago, and it was founded as a burial society in the northern Dutch city of Leeuwarden. Not sure how many people know Leeuwarden, but it's a beautiful old city in Friesland. This was also the time when many Dutch people were emigrating to the United States or settling and settling across the land from the east to the west here in the US. These persons also moved from their country to your country looking for a new, brighter and better future. They had an enduring journey and were interested in a new world. I think it's something very typical for us Dutch, probably because we have a small country, we in general have been interested in overseas we have been interested in the world. So I can very well imagine these Dutch people going from, was it east to west in what was a quite a big, big adventure. And they built multiple Amsterdams, as you know, uh, in Ohio and Minnesota, and of course, New Amsterdam, which was the first name of New York. They also created a new version of Harlem, which is uh, in New York, and you're well aware of that. And they established US cities in with Dutch names such as Delft in Minnesota, Leiden, Massachusetts, and uh, I think New uh, Holland in Michigan. So a lot of links in many parts of the world and we should be all very proud of these links and not only ensure that they continue but improve them, strengthen them. Something which I have seen you doing, Ambassador, in a very, very effective way. It uh, fills me also with pride to know that there is no other country in the world with so many Dutch-related names as in the US. 
Um, it's certainly a coincidence that the US ambassador in the Netherlands has a Dutch name, but I come across very often Dutch names, names on the streets, names on boulevards. When we get into New York, is it Van Wijk Boulevard? Pronounce it probably differently than you would pronounce it, but it's very clearly a Dutch name. Um, <clears throat> and that underpins our long history, and we need to make sure we do everything to nurture that. So to come back now to Transamerica, here in the 90s, we expanded materially with the acquisition of Transamerica and its tower, the pyramid in San Francisco. It's a, a name that I'm sure you all know, um, and I experience this every time when I get through immigration. Um, when I'm being asked, what are you doing here? Um, when I stand for business, and uh, when they ask me, what business? I'm, uh, I'm working for a life insurance company. Insurance company? Yes, an insurance company. Do you carry any cash with you? I don't know why the two come together. <laughs> I, said, uh, I said, no, sir, I'm not carrying any cash. By the way, what is the company you work for? I say, Egon, with a Dutch accent. <laughs> and I can sense at that point in time, I think the immigration office is just about to stand up and take me to a little room in the back and ask me more questions. And before he does it, I always would say, sir, do you know Transamerica? Yes, of course, I know Transamerica. My sister has a policy, or my brother worked there, and I know the tower. And then I say, well, we own Transamerica. And that's usually, <laughs> sir, have a great day. <laughs> you should try this once. <laughs> and that's, um, I'm, I'm coming here often, because the US is a very relevant market for us. We generate more than 60% of our earnings here, more than 60%. I think we are probably the company in the Netherlands that generates by far the largest part of its earnings here. And we serve, probably more importantly, 13 million customers. And these customers, as well as the customers around the world, are being confronted or blessed, that's how you see it, with longer life expectancy. And I believe the global increase in longevity as a result of aging is something which requires us to all think about retirement. Sorry. <laughs> I thought a second was the award that was falling down. No. And I'm saying this because for many people, um, living older is a, is a gift. But at the same time, for many people, the, the idea of becoming much older and living older is a constant worry we have to address that. It should not be seen as a worry. It should be seen as a gift, and a gift that we all benefit from. That means that as an organization, and it sounds very simple, but the reality is less simple, we have learned that in order to be able to fully enjoy a longer life, people must not only plan, but prepare for their futures. And when we say that, it sounds obvious, but it's not obvious. Most people don't have a pension plan. Most people are not yet prepared for retirement. Most people don't even want to talk about it. It's an experience you can try when you ask somebody, so how well are you prepared for retirement? It's, no, no, that's fine. No. It's all okay. The reality is most cases people don't know and perhaps don't want to know. We also need to take into account there's a big connection between retirement and health. Uh, it's great to be able to retire, but if you're not healthy, it's probably not going to be the best thing in the world. On the other side, if you want to live older, you need to be healthy. And we also know that health has a certain price. It is a cost, and not everybody can afford it. So the two are very closely inter interrelated. Uh, and this is one of the things we're seeing and we're trying to bring at the forefront um, more and more. That is a responsibility of every individual to think about his own health and his own financial security for retirement. And that's why we are proud that our Egon Center for Longevity and Retirement um, that we have here uh, under the name Transamerica, of course, um, we have surveyed over 100,000 people in 15 countries across the globe. And what you see is uh, their readiness is different in different places. But the worries, the thing they think about, uh, the steps they have to take are all very, very consistent. Um, it's only a question of time and a question of phase in which we are. And I believe that this is becoming our major, if not our biggest societal um, challenge, that we together 
have to find a solution for. We have to ensure that together we find the right solutions for everybody to be able to work, to be able to save for retirement, to have enough to be able to save for retirement, allowing a dignified retirement. Let me just give you a few numbers just to uh, put in the context how things have changed. So just over the last 50 years, the life expectancy at birth for women in our Western world has increased by nearly 10 years. At the same time, the average of years in retirement grew from nine years in 1958 to 16 years today. So people are getting older and people are living a much longer period in retirement. And of course, this has to be funded by pensions. This has to be funded by society if we haven't made the necessary retirements. And the challenge is made even greater. According to the OECD in the European Union, we see big shifts in the old age ratios. And the old age ratio, as you know, is the ratio between the number of persons age 65 and over and the number of persons of working age between 15 or 16 and 64. So in 2015, there were 30 people over 65 for every 100 people of working age. So in other words, every, for 30 people, there were 100 people working, allowing them to retire. And by 2050, which is not that far away, that number will always, almost have doubled to 56 people. So 56 people that are not working anymore and retired will depend on 100 people working. So it's very simple to see with these statistics how much our system is being challenged and also how important, how urgent it is that we do something very quickly and we do something decisively. And then, of course, with the low interest rates, which has been part of government policies or central bank policies in the US and in Europe in particular, the problem has become even bigger because the savings we have do not generate enough return that is needed in order to be able to um, retire later. Imagine that you have low rates here in the US with 10-year Treasury bonds at 2.5%. In Europe, it's at 0% and in some cases even negative. It means that when you have savings, you have to give something up in order to be able to hold on these savings. It's nearly impossible to imagine that you cannot even save 100 euros, that you will put 100 euros in your savings account and you'll get 99 back. That is a reality. So that makes the problem even bigger if we want to address it from a financial point of view. And this means that long-standing social contracts for retirements are crumbling everywhere in the world. And as I said earlier, reform is urgently need to relieve the financial strain, to relieve social security schemes in the countries and other government benefits that are just no longer affordable. I was um, earlier this week in uh, Paris for a conference with the OECD, and that's where we launched our really call for action for what we call the modernization of the social contract. The former, the old social contract, was really one between the state, the government, employees, and employees. And we recognize the need for a new social contract that must recognize the changes and developments taking place today, I just shared them with you, but also embrace the social and economic realities of tomorrow. The social contract, the new social contract, is based on empowering the individual to take himself responsibility for a secure retirement instead of relying on the state or the employer that we know is no more able and cannot afford anymore to take care of the retirement. It's an empowerment of the individual and the individual has to be empowered, um, has to be helped. That means we have to provide access to pension plans, retirement schemes, which is not readily available for everybody. We have to ensure that there is much more financial education. We have to ensure that younger people think about retirement. It's very difficult to speak about retirement about, with somebody who is not 35 or 40 years old. And then it's actually already, unfortunately, too late. And I also believe, and I will say this here in this country, that the new social contract will need to honor the principles of solidarity, of solidarity between the different groups of people. 
And certainly, am I not talking about one group working for the other and passing it over? No, I'm talking about pooling assets, pooling risk, in order to assure a better outcome for everybody. That form of solidarity is the one that is going to be essential if you want to have a chance to be successful in providing a decent retirement to everybody. Also, technology innovation will all play a very important role. So to conclude here, success can only be achieved through collaboration. The new social contract is an excellent example. And it has to be between all social partners, including governments, employers, individuals, but also including the private sector, the private financial sector, and of course companies like Egon and Transamerica that are very willing to play part of that. Talking about collaboration, um, I would also like to acknowledge uh, today the congressional leaders, and in particular Chairman Neal and Ranking Member Brady, on the SECURE Act. It's a ma major bipartisan piece of legislation that is going to put in place to improve the retirement security of all Americans. It's an important piece, and I very much welcome that this is now happening and taking place after what I understand has been over a five-year period of finding the right solution. And I hope the, uh, the, House, uh, the full House um, will vote on confirmation on that bill this week, later this week. So on these words, I would like to um, conclude that we are here together and recognizing all the things that we can do together and also the importance of working within the world. And you mentioned yourself in the world between the transatlantic, which is still by far the most important relationship that we have. It's a few words to you, Hannah, if I allow, if you allow me to say, Hannah, you will have to get used to that, not more Mr. Ambassador. Or, uh, <laughs> I would like to express my gratitude to you for the care you have taken in enriching and maintaining, improving the relationship between the US and, and the Netherlands. Um, I've seen it at work uh, when we had the opportunity to be a guest of your president, very close here, how you have built um, the bridges that allowed this meeting to take place, um, which has been instrumental, certainly for our prime minister, for our government, but also for our nation and all the other business interests we have here. So I don't know how well you have planned for retirement. <laughs> I think you have still the advantage of having a good plan that's been provided by your government. Um, so that's a good thing. And in any case, if there's anything we can do there, we are happy to help you. <laughs> and um, I hope that you'll be able to enjoy the free time that you will be having, or a little bit more free time. I understand that you're going to be living in Brussels, which is very close to the Netherlands, but still very different. Um, and anyway, I am looking forward to continuing to holding and maintaining the relationship we have built and would like to say thank you to all of you that you attended. Very pleased also to see uh, former ambassador of the US in, uh, in the Netherlands with her husband. Um, that's really great that both of you are here. I appreciate that too. And a number of other friends. So thank you very much. I'm extremely honored with the award. Um, I will make sure, assuming that I am able to, to take it with me, uh, that it has a good place in, uh, in, in my office and later also wherever I will retire, because also I will retire one day. Thank you very much. Thank you.